Holstein America is sponsored by Merck Animal Health, an industry leader in dairy care solutions, and the makers of Vista vaccines. Visit thebestdefense.com to learn more. It's sleepless nights and joyous dawns, a family's history and heritage. It's a heart for the cows and eyes for the future. It's resiliency and spirit. It's contributing to something bigger than yourself and providing milk and dairy products for people around the world. None of this would be possible without U.S. Registered Holsteins, the world's perfect cow and the people who raise them. It's a neat thought and it's, uh, it's also a good feeling to know that you uh, are actually supplying the world with food. Each generation just gets better and better. Pretty amazing where things have gone and how these cows can produce. I just really think there's an added value to having a registered animal with a pedigree behind it. And I think for the future, with all the information we can get, I think the sky's the limit um, of what we can do and where the industry's headed. This is Holstein America. Hi, I'm Michelle Davidson. The Holstein cow with her signature black and white spots is perhaps the most recognized animal in the world. When most people, young or old, visualize a cow, it's her. What we often don't realize is that behind this amazing animal is an important story. One that's contributed to life for thousands of years, nature's perfect food, milk. Holsteins produce more than 90% of all milk in the United States today, supplying us with fresh, quality products and keeping our refrigerators full. In the next hour, we'll meet people and families who raise registered Holsteins and who are committed to the dairy way of life. And we'll explore the programs offered by Holstein Association USA, the world's largest dairy breed organization. The Holstein today is a perfect picture of efficiency, providing more pounds of high quality milk, like this, with less environmental impact than ever before. And it means we can meet the challenge of feeding a growing world. When I was a little boy, we had three billion people in the world. Today we have 7.6, and by the time I'm an old man, we'll have nine and a half billion people. And that means we'll have three times more people on this planet throughout our lifetimes. And the question then becomes, how do we feed these people? Because we'll not have three times more natural resources to do so. So how do we satisfy that demand? That's the question of our lifetimes. We have to become more efficient in how we produce food. People around the world think, that modern agricultural production is harming the environment, that we're going the wrong way, that we need to revert back to the 1950s. And that's not true. Back in 1950, we used to have 25 million dairy cows in this country. Today, we have nine million dairy cows, but we are producing 60% more milk with this much smaller herd. That means the carbon footprint of a gallon of milk in this country has shrunk by two thirds. So in the United States today, we produce approximately 23,000 pounds of milk per cow per year. It takes about five cows in Mexico and approximately 20 cows in India to produce the same amount of milk as one cow here. Today, we are actually the envy of the world with respect to how we produce dairy and beef and all the other commodities. And if you compare, let's say, dairy milk, cow milk, to alternatives, let's say almond juice, I don't call it almond milk because almonds don't lactate. But if you compare dairy milk to almond juice, then it's true that the dairy milk has a higher carbon footprint, meaning higher greenhouse gases. But on the other side, the almonds need 17 times more water. So what is the trade-off? You reduce the carbon footprint by eating this over that, but the water footprint is now 17 times higher on the other side. So I think a big mistake we do is finger pointing and trying to identify what the worst offenders are. And I can tell you that we have gone the right direction across the animal agricultural sector for the last decade. We know that ruminant livestock such as beef and dairy and others produce greenhouse gases such as methane. The question is how significant, how great an impact is that on the overall changing climate? We've done a lot of research over the years quantifying those impacts, 
And now we have a really good feel for what the contribution of the dairy sector is on the nation's greenhouse gases. In the United States, these impacts amount to 2%. So 2% of all greenhouse gases in this country stem from the dairy sector. And globally, all U.S. sources, everything we do in this country combined, equals 12% of the total global greenhouse gases. 11 of the 12% is fossil fuel use in the U.S. And 1% is everything we eat in the United States. Half of that 1% is plant agriculture, the other half is animal agriculture. One thing that's really important to note is that not just have we, through groundbreaking research, found out what the contributions are, but we have identified ways to further reduce those emissions. US-wide by 25%, in California, 40%. These are pledges that are not just empty words, but they are already making progress. I think one of the, the aspects that people like to forget is that efficiencies in production, becoming more efficient on the one hand, is correlated to environmental footprint. When production goes up per animal, environmental footprint goes down. Because what it means is that we can shrink our flocks and herds, and by doing so, we have fewer animals while still producing the same amount of product. We have been doing this for the longest time. We will continue to do it in the future. I have not seen any other dairy industry throughout the world that had a better environmental track record than the dairy industry in this country. A Holstein cow today here in the United States, they're the highest producing cows, the ones with the greatest yield. Those cows are so adaptable to different environments. So uh, to have cows that produce at a very high level in a way that is sustainable is uh, an important success story that the Holstein industry has. These farmers have one thing in mind, and that is to be the best steward of the land they can be because they are not just doing this for themselves and for their family today, but they want to hand this place on to their kids and to their grandkids. They do it because they want to work on the legend that they leave behind. Thanks to dedicated farmers, our kitchens are stocked full with an abundance of dairy products. Delicious milk, cheese, yogurt, and ice cream, never more than a grocery stop away. And Americans today are consuming more dairy products than they have in more than 50 years. Chateau Milk Company in Missouri is a local hotspot for fresh milk and dairy products. Their farm is a popular destination for visitors to learn how milk is produced. And since upgrading to an all-registered herd, Chateau Milk Company has experienced a major jump in production and efficiency allowing them to produce more quality products with fewer cows. Chateau Milk Company has been in business uh, bottling milk here since 2003. Been milking cows here for over uh, 70 or 80 years. We do the glass bottles, we do uh, several different flavors in those bottles. We do about 10,000 a day uh, through our plant. Kind of our mainstay here is the fluid milk. We try to make the milk fun for the kids to, to come and try the different flavors and come and see uh, the cows and see what we do here on a daily basis. We do tours um, five days a week, about 500 people come through. We allow them to uh, you know, taste our products here in the, in the country store. Um, we allow them to uh, see our processing of the milk, the bottling of the milk. We also allow them to hand milk a cow, see some of the baby calves, and and then actually see where we milk the cows every day. And I think seeing what we do here, seeing the hard work that goes behind those products, um, seeing the care that goes behind those products, you know, it paints a, a full picture for a young mind to understand where their food's kind of coming from. We're several generations removed from the farm now, and allowing those young people to, to come here and see those things, I think that smile on their face and, you know, talking about our products and saying my mom buys your chocolate milk all the time and, and we love your products. I think that's a, a huge motivation for us as well. We run almost 24 seven, whether it be milking cows or being in the plant, um, processing milk or making cheese or butter um, or delivery routes. Uh, there's something, something going on all the time. We milk about 300 registered Holstein cows here three times a day. 
Holstein Cow makes a, a really good product for us to market and uh, a consistent product too. So we average um, about nine gallon a cow a day and 100% of that milk is either used for our fluid milk products or our cheese butter ice cream or cream. When we're processing milk here, we'll have milk in the bottle from the cow within 24 hours. By us, you know, doing something different with the glass bottles, and I think that brought in a whole new perspective of, uh, you know, let's bring back the milkman that brings our milk right to the door. A lot of generations have not seen that, so I think the trend of, you know, everybody delivering to everybody's doorstep continues. Uh, you know, we're, we're just a, kind of the leading edge of an old technology, I think. We've competed a lot in the world uh, dairy products um, and won several awards with our root beer milk, some with our butter, some with our chocolate milk. Uh, the chocolate milks also traveled to the uh, White House. Dairy farming, you put a lot of hours in, you put a lot of, a lot of time and, and effort into things and, and just to have that product going out to consumers and feeling confident that all that hard work, you've done a good job, you're putting a product out there that's a healthy, wholesome product. The Holstein cow has been an icon um, in, in all of agriculture for, for many years, and I think uh, it kind of gives you a sense of pride. It's the perfect cow for what we're doing here with all the information we can gain. We've been registering cows here um, for about five years. Um, we've started out with a basic ID. Uh, registering our grade cows up, and that's been beneficial in selecting new sires and animals that will perform better in this herd. Just allows us to look into the future a little bit farther. Um, it's good to collect all that data so that we can, uh, not just two years down the road, but five years or 10 years down the road, still be uh, making a better cow. By selecting and, and moving to the registered side, um, we've been able to reduce the total number of animals here, but get higher production out of those cows. We've dropped about 100 animals from when we were doing just grade cows to the registered Holstein cows. The registered Holstein uh, allows us to do such a variety of things and, and allows us to put a variety of products out for our customers and, and I think for the future. With all the information we can get, I think the sky's the limit um, of what we can do and where the industry's headed hope is that we can continue that, doing this for years and years and continue to make high quality products for, for our customers and for other you know dairymen out there, dairy women out there. Hopefully they can kind of find their niche too, that whether it be in genetics or marketing milk, you know, the hope is that everybody can be prosperous in it. When we return, we learn about one of the key drivers of the dairy industry, pizza, and how registered Holsteins make it all possible. Holstein America is brought to you by our friends at Merck Animal Health, the makers of Vista and the leading provider of dairy care solutions. Visit dairycare365.com for support, tips, and products to provide your herd with the best possible care. Welcome back. Milk from dairy cows is a remarkable product. Filled with essential nutrients and protein, it's the world's greatest health food. And registered Holsteins produce more total pounds of milk, butter fat and protein than any other dairy breed, making them perfectly suited for the growing cheese market. In the United States, we consume more than 35 pounds of cheese per person each year, and a great deal of that comes in the form of a family favorite, pizza. Miles Ramsey has the story. Served up in slices around the country, about 25% of all U.S. cheese ends up on a pizza. That's according to Jimmy Simonte of the pizza giant Domino's. This is encouraging news to the nation's dairy farmers who have a shared interest in growing demand for the family favorite meal. Selling more pizza means selling more dairy. When somebody makes the decision to buy Domino's and, uh, and feed their family with a pizza that night instead of burgers or fries, there's a lot more dairy involved in that transaction. And so uh, our ability to grow beyond the traditional pizza category is, is pretty thrilling. Domino's has a long-held reputation for pizza delivery, and Samante says to attract new customers, they've been growing more into the carryout market. Following trends in consumer behavior and meeting their needs is the number one priority. But at the end of the day, we are consumers, right? We buy food, we feed our family, we feed our kids, and, and we 
have the right and the ability to make the decisions on how we spend our dollars, right? And so, so we all want to be here tomorrow. We want to build companies and businesses that sustain our families. Uh, and doing that is, requires that we address and embrace the consumers. Over the years, Domino's Pizza has also embraced the dairy community. Samante says the franchise owners of Domino's locations, about 800 independent business people, have more in common with dairy producers than meets the eye. These are uh, traditionally family-run businesses. Um, we work retail hours. We don't get to take the day off when it's a holiday or it's bad weather or things like that. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a small independent business owner who's working under the umbrella of Domino's Pizza. When we started partnering with the dairy farmers, we found this uh, brotherhood, this camaraderie. The Holstein cow has even made an appearance on Domino's Pizza Boxes, a popular tribute to the ultimate source of pizza's primary ingredient, cheese. What I would love uh, every dairy farmer to know is that, uh, first and foremost, we thank them and appreciate them. Uh, we wouldn't be in business, we wouldn't be able to sell a single pizza if we didn't have cheese. It is not a lost fact on us. That is, you know, uh, the, the biggest component of our product and the most important component of our product. And so, so we, uh, we love and embrace uh, and respect that. For Holstein America, I'm Miles Ramsey. Thanks, Miles. Keeping pace with hungry consumers requires highly productive dairy farmers, like those found in California's Central Valley. It's one of the most diverse agricultural regions in the country. Curtis Vandenberg and his family have been raising Holsteins here for many years and supplying milk to consumers in nearby Los Angeles. Uh, my name is Curtis Vandenberg, and today we're in Bakersfield, California at Vandenberg Dairy. A partnership together along with my parents. Dad just took off from that tractor right there. So we're only uh, about 100 miles north of Los Angeles right here. So pretty much all of our milk goes down over the hill into Los Angeles. 15 million people just over that hill. Family started with my grandfather. After he got out of World War II, he kind of started milking cows in Southern California. And then dad kind of took it over when he got old enough. And then 2004, we decided to sell the dairy down there and move to Bakersfield. It's been here for 15 years now. We've done some upgrades you know, along the way as we've been here too. Added some soakers and cow cooling. Cow comfort is definitely our biggest thing we can control. Uh, if we can keep the cows comfortable you know, as it gets hotter, as the temperature heats up, try and keep them cool. You know, In the winter time, we try and keep them you know, dry and keep bedding underneath them. And we definitely see huge returns as we keep their cow comfort level higher. Yeah, so our milking parlor, we have two double 40s, so I can milk 160 cows at one time. We do milk cows three times a day. Components are huge. So starting in 2009, we put a plan in place that we're gonna try and make high component Holsteins. Now this last spring, we had over a 4.0 butterfat, and we're gonna try and make a year where we have entire year over a 4.0 butterfat. We're about 10 years into genomics right now with the dairy industry. The reliabilities get a lot more accurate. Bulls aren't changing as much. It's really interesting to see as you go forward with genomics, the animals that tested really high as a calf, now that they are getting older, you know, and starting to milk and perform, that genomic test is very accurate. So we've actually been pretty heavy into using genomic bulls now for the last eight or nine years. Uh, I think out of the top 13 proven bulls in the breed, we're milking daughters out of 10 of them. Uh, today with registered Holsteins. I think they're um, definitely dual purpose. There's a lot of options available with them. Um, they make pretty good meat. You're able to make some value added animals there. I think they're very efficient. I think they make a lot of pounds of product. So when you start talking about fat and protein, they definitely make a lot of pounds of fat, pounds of protein. You know, and that's what we're ultimately after. Um, so we're a complete herd. So basically we classify for sure once a year. Sometimes we'll add on, do twice a year. We'll add cows onto set programs. Um, we also evolved with the TriStar program, so basically all that information ends up back with Holstein. It shows up on a pedigree, um, kind of trying to make it full circle. You want to get in on this? Looks <laughs> like I am. <laughs> um, we're going to the commodity barn. All right, sounds good. Yeah, so this is some of that corn that I was talking about that we'll cut here about 4th of July and pretty much within 24 hours after we cut it, we'll have the ground turned over and planting corn again. So this is our commodity barn. It's kind of where all the 
Rations happen where all the feeding takes place. We have all these products here, almond holes, minerals, safflower meal, soybean meal, mill run canola, cottonseed, kind of all products that humans can't eat, that a cow can eat and turn into food for a human. So these are almond holes. When they shake those off the tree, they bring them into an almond holer and they separate all that. And we're able to feed the almond holes back to cattle. Some of the largest carrot growers in the United States are in Bakersfield, so we of course feed their products. Uh, there's a lot of onions that are grown and processed in Bakersfield. The onion will look perfectly fine. It'll just have a funny bump on the side or an odd shape, and it doesn't end up in the supermarket. It ends up as cattle feed. So a ruminant's a pretty incredible animal. What they can eat, digest, and turn into milk. Five-year plan, 10-year plan, I want to you know, be right here where we're standing. Milk and cows still, I definitely want to trying to continue to have a better herd than what I have right now. Uh, so I'm a father, I have two little kids, Case and Tessa. I'm married to my wife, Stacy, for seven years. And uh, we're definitely excited to see if the next generation will take over. I hope someday they grow up and enjoy cattle as much as I do. Uh, I hope they have the opportunity to be here and milk cows. That's what they wanna do. Coming up next, Holstein America travels to South Carolina to visit Clemson University, which recently installed robots to improve the efficiency of its dairy. This program is broadcast with support from Merck Animal Health. Trust in Vista vaccines for the most complete, longest-lasting respiratory protection for your dairy and one-dose fetal protection for your cow herd. Learn more at thebestdefense.com. Welcome back. When we think about South Carolina, we think of palmettos, beaches, and some of the best college football in the country. But it's also home to dairy. And Clemson University has one of the South's best known dairy research centers. To ensure the program continues at the forefront of industry changes, the university recently invested in a robotic milking facility, a technology that is changing the dairy business for good. Well, this part of South Carolina, we're still a small town, but we got access to big towns around us. And probably the biggest Clemson ever is is when we have a football game on Saturday and they fill up 85,000 <laughs> in the stadium. I came to Clemson in 2000. They pretty much let me man just this way I see it. And I've really enjoyed that, you know, because I've run this just like it was mine. The old facilities moved in here in 1976. And we were getting to the point where we were gonna to have to do a bunch of renovations or a total new dairy operation. When we got to looking at the actual figures, this was gonna come pretty close to what we could do. Same thing with a new parallel with all the bells and whistles. And we would have to build another building out. And this was where we were able to contain the robots. We've got a good group of young people coming in that's really more technology interested than I am. You know, technology seems to be driving a lot of stuff. You know, cows seem to like technology. And these students are going out into the real world and, and seeing that what they got here was very valuable for them to, to succeed as ag teachers or, or lenders or whatever they want to be involved. But we also see a coming market for people that can manage these kinds of operations. Because I mean, this is coming, you know. It's, it's, it's really going to come on, I think, pretty strong in the next 10 years, the robotic side of it. And they're going to be looking for managers that can manage these things. So we hope to give those students that ability to go out and, and be a manager. I'm always about the relationship with the animal. I think that's what's always drawn me to animal science. It's why I'm here at Clemson. I've learned so much, everything from vaccinating to herding, everything when it comes to what goes into making good feed. and what volume of milk is gonna be your butter fat content. We even had to work a milking shift, which was really cool. Now that I'm here, I would never change that path for anything. And I love working with the kids. The kids have got an interest. Those are the guys that you hear the success stories on them out in the industry some way or the other. You know, we've even had students here that applied to vet school and didn't get in, then come work for me for a semester or two, and then reapplied and got in. There were registered cows here when I came in 2000. We kind of got the program rolling along and we've done some embryo transfer work to try to improve on genetics. We look at the type side of it, but we also try to keep in mind the production side too, because we're a state funded dairy, but we only get so much state funding at the beginning, then we take over on our revenue to keep this thing running. So we are a business. We have to operate this just like anybody in the dairy business. 
I like the genetic side of it, so I really kind of worked on more of the breeding and, you know, the matings and stuff like that. We made strides in production and genetics, and we've used available all the Holstein programs. We're a complete herd, which we get the DHRR records and get the, the mating services plus the classifications. and. So we've used the hosting programs pretty regular here that I think has really advanced our genetic base. There is a lot of interest, you know, for the general public or dairymen to come in to Clemson to see what we are doing here as far as interest in the education part as well as the research. So we support the researchers on campus. We try to do the education side of it more than anything else. And, you know, we get group tours that are basically advertised through Greenville newspapers or Greenville websites and we also have our own website that you know kind of induces what we're doing here and what we see. Uh, we get a lot of repeats you know people that's been here and left and come back to see what's going on. We get a lot of school tours a lot of young kids come through on school tours and we get interest from those kids you know kids you never thought would be interested in this after they've been out and see stuff they're interested enough to, to pursue it in school too. Cow comfort is probably more important than a lot of people give credit for. You know, these cows under these fans and under these sprinklers and then laying in sand bedding and rubbers down the walkways and automatic flush systems, you know, we get the thing from the public, well, you know, they're not out on grass anymore. These cows are so much more comfortable right here than they ever would be out on grass, especially on a 98 degree day, because all they're gonna do is huddle in the shade, you know, that, that kind of thing. So we've seen the quality improve. We've also seen milk production improve. We've seen components get better. So everything's been a big plus. And we've got a good crew of people that are capable of doing pretty much anything to help make things even better for the future. No matter where they call home, dairy farmers who raise registered Holsteins have an advantage. By registering their animals, they have access to more data, which allows them to chart a course for the future. Star Summit Farm, located just east of Lake Michigan, understands this well. For generations, they've been committed to improving their herd of registered Holsteins. I love how quiet the farm is in the morning how peaceful it is. I enjoy that time, that quiet time in the morning. I think it's, you know, very special to be a part of what Tim and his family has built here. I have to say that when I started at 10 or 12 years old, I didn't realize the full extent that the legacy that this farm had built. I think that the more that I worked with other farmers and was more knowledgeable actually what the dairy industry meant. That's when I realized the impact that Tim and his father Henry and now his sons and his daughter have built here. And I think it's really special to be around a place that, you know, has some history to it. The farm is Star Summit Farm, milked about 80, 85 cows. My grandpa moved here in 1910 and joined the uh, Halstein Association in 59 and started registered ever since then. Well, we milk two times a day. Our rolling herd average is 28,000, I think, and BAA, and we're pushing about 111. We're looking for just good sound cows that last and that are here for generations. Each generation just gets better and better. I mean, from 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, it's pretty amazing where things have gone and how these cows can produce. We are on the west side of Michigan. We're about 20 minutes southwest of Grand Rapids. Only a short half hour jog from the lakeshore. I think it's just really conducive to cow comfort here. We get great weather. We have beautiful springs and typically dry and beautiful summers, which the cows love. Even into the fall, we have great weather where they can be in the pasture. And it's just really nice scenery to look at as we farm. Our cows are in freestyle, so we try to bed the freestyles every 10 days, 12 days, so they're comfortable. Summertime, they have fans, they got sprinklers on them. We try to keep them as comfortable as we can, as the more you take care of them, I think the more they produce. I think it's so unique that each cow just kind of tends to have her own personality. I mean, the more that you spend time around 
calves born and they grow into mature cows. It's kind of fun to watch the personalities. What stands apart with the registered cows, and I think it's just building off the generations. You can see the family lines. You can see what came behind them. And I think that it's rewarding to not only breed just one pretty looking cow, but to build a solid foundation to grow that family and to expand that into, you know, 13, 14 generations. I just think registered housing, there's a good value. Good registered cows with good pedigrees are worth some good money. The perfect cow to me is one that will last for six, seven lactations or even a little longer. You know, a 10 year old cow that is excellent and milks and transmits. That's the perfect cow to me. I wish the consumer knew that as someone who produces milk, I am still a consumer myself. You know, I think it's easy to look at the industry now and be very pessimistic about it, but I think that farmers, especially registered dairy farmers, you know, it's a pride thing. You're proud of what you've built, and to have that legacy, a written record of it, I think is just kind of cool to see that. Yes, we may be facing new hardships that we didn't face 10 years ago, and you know, the landscape of dairy is ever-changing, but that doesn't mean that it can't grow into something and continue on into something beautiful. Holstein America will be back after this informational segment from Merck Animal Health. We're at Warmth of Holsteins in Fox Lake, Wisconsin. I'm the third generation on this family farm. I'm the oldest of four kids. I do, I'm the herdsman here at Warmka Holsteins. We currently milk 450 cows with about 520 total cows, including the dry cows. We're just over 28,000 early herd average. It's the team effort, not just one person. It's really a blessing to be in the dairy land. Today, Eric and I were working in the barn. We are a husband and wife team from that perspective. Working with my wife is definitely rewarding. It's fun to be able to spend more time with her and have spend time in the barn with each other. So I became a veterinarian in 2014, graduated from the University of Minnesota, and I wanted to do cow medicine. I helped develop the protocols for vaccination as well as any treatments that need to be done on the farm. Today we did give calves that were born overnight some vaccines. Once PMH, intranasal is our primary vaccine. If we can keep health events down when they're a baby calf within that first 90 days, then we can maximize their milk production, and then they're usually less likely to have metabolic issues right when they calve in for the first time. And then in the fresh cow pen, we are also giving Vista 5L5 because they are right in that 30 to 35 day mark, and that will get them across the next lactation. When we were actually talking about a whole herd coverage, you get the most bang for your buck out of a modified live vaccine. So we start when they're younger with three doses, and with those three doses, they should be protected up until they start lactating with their first calving, which is huge. Um, there's a long duration of coverage with the product, um, so we don't have to reboost after that pre-breeding shot as a heifer. The Vista line has helped us create healthy animals from day one, um, and a healthy animal from day one creates a very uh, profitable, healthy cow. So if we have the right vaccines to the right company, which is our Vista line, then I know from the bacterial pneumonia side, from the viral pneumonia, from the reproductive, that we are completely covered from end to end, and there's no holes in our program. When a cow actually calves in for the first time, she's gonna milk the 100 pounds that we want, she's gonna be low in somatic cell, and she's gonna take off like a champ. Holstein America is sponsored by Merck Animal Health, an industry leader in dairy care solutions and the makers of Vista vaccines. Visit thebestdefense.com to learn more. Welcome back. Everywhere you look today, people are using smartphones and other devices to make their lives better. It's no different in the dairy industry as increasing numbers of registered Holstein breeders look to technology to improve management, health, and cow comfort. We learn about the latest advancements in this next story from Miles Ramsey. 
Everywhere you look, our lives are dominated by technology. The ability to track and monitor information has never been greater, and the nation's dairy farmers are seeing the benefits. Wearable technology is the latest tech trend to hit dairy farms, according to Jeffrey Bewley with Alltech. It's really kind of neat, but basically what we do is we borrow ideas from other parts of the world. So a lot of the wearable technologies that we have on our farms today, they're basically like a Fitbit. They actually use the same technology that's in a Fitbit called an accelerometer. So we use the Fitbit technology to measure things like activity levels for estrus detection or rumination time and eating time. So we get behavioral information where these tags basically are watching the cows 24 hours a day. On the horizon is more image-based technology, Bewley says, where cameras could evaluate important measures like body condition score, linear traits, and locomotion scoring. We're using the same cameras that are used in things like the Xbox. And so we take those base technologies that become relatively inexpensive because of wide adoption levels in other industries and we bring them into the dairy industry, modify them for our use to be able to provide us these new data sources, which gives us a lot of information from a day-to-day -day management perspective of the individual animals, but I, I think the next horizon is, is being able to use this information for genetic selection also. The challenge, Bewley explains, becomes managing the data and creating from it impactful information to improve the overall dairy community. Data will be a source of competitive advantage for dairy producers. Those that are able to use data the best are going to be the ones that are the most competitive, uh, not unlike what we see in every other part of the world. It's also going to be able to provide, I think, opportunities to provide healthier animals and to make the lives of the farmer a little bit easier. And so I think there's a whole lot of intangible benefits to this kind of information. Holstein Association USA, the world's largest dairy breed organization, offers the latest programs and services to ensure dairy producers take advantage of the latest technology and the valuable information it provides. For Holstein America, I'm Miles Ramsey. Thanks, Miles. In many ways, technology is reshaping the dairy industry and providing new opportunities for the next generation. The Richard family in Indiana has experienced this firsthand. Taking a leap of faith, they recently transitioned from a tie stall barn to robotic milking systems, learning to care for and manage their herd of registered Holsteins in an entirely new way. With our barns not having been upgraded for years, we kind of felt we had two options. We either had to get out of the cow business or we had to, we had to make some changes. These pictures on the first page are, are some of the pictures we took that were firsts. As we were making progress, each phase was encouraging because it was one step closer to our, to our dream. For a long time, we'd say, you know, people would come and look and say, well, see those two bricks in the concrete? That's where the robots are going to be. <laughs> it's just uh, it's hard to imagine. The day they came, they took them off of the trailer, out of the trailer or container, and put them down here, got them ready, and brought them in the barn and set them on the platforms that same day. It was a long day. And it was cold. <laughs> it was just cold. He shut the door the last night on the old barn and we opened the first, the, the last morning. I told the girls as they were coming in, you guys have no idea what today is going to do for you. You're going to be, this is your last visit to the And these are the last cows going out. So this is this. the new barn reason realized. <laughs> <laughs> Standing in there milking. And if you don't ever upgrade, I think it leaves a negative impression to our children, like there's really no life in this. That part is probably as rewarding as anything, thinking that we've accomplished a dream of being able to pass the farm on to the next generation. Well, I grew up on a dairy farm. Uh, Wayne County, Ohio, got involved in registered cows and like the challenge of breeding good cows, uh, that passion has kind of been the thing that has kept me in the cow business and uh, you know, trying to do better all the time. 
This is my home state and my home area where I grew up as a little girl, but I married an Ohio boy in um, 85. We lived there for nine years and then we relocated here in 94. I'm the last of five siblings, so I was born and raised here and uh, been here for 21 years. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good life. Being able to work with family is one of the biggest positives and it's super fun seeing the, the grandchildren and, and them uh, come in the barn and, and want to see the cows and, and uh, play on the catwalk and, and do those Watch things. That's uh, very rewarding as a grandpa. Okay. So since the robots, we don't have a alarm clock set, and the morning chores are actually, it's actually an enjoyable time. This is the first time in our life we have not set the alarm to when we go to bed, and that is so crazy. <laughs> and now we just wake up whenever our body wakes up. We're doing other things that could attribute to better cow comfort. Um, because we don't need to spend those same hours just just harvesting the milk. It was a, definitely a process you wanted to take a lot of, uh, put a lot of thought and consideration into. This is obviously a whole uh, new realm of management uh, compared to the previous operation. We figured if we worked hard and tried hard, um, if somebody else could do it, we should be able to do it too. I have not been sorry. I have not missed milking because I actually still get to be interacting with the cows every day. With the computers and the, and the robots, we can control pretty much, pretty much everything from our smartphones. Just being able to see each individual cow's performance anywhere, anytime, is really neat. And my granddaughters uh, that live an hour away love to have me pull up the camera. We can watch the cows go through the robot. Technology certainly uh, isn't at a standstill, and so things are going to continue to change. There's just a, a, a bunch of things all together that make it that make it fun and exciting to get up each day. The registered herd, I couldn't be here without that. I mean, my goal would be to leave the dairy industry, uh, genetics, if you will, better because of the efforts that I put into it. The Holstein cow is obviously an amazing animal. Being able to keep track of records and numbers and cow families, you know, makes it easier to improve the herd. I'm really happy with the production where it's at. Rolling herd average has been right around the, the 32,000 range. The ability of cows to maybe not produce just volume, but now the, the trend has changed more towards pounds of fat and protein, a combined component value, and, and we have cows that are doing that really, really well. There will always be cows. There will always be people milking cows. If you are really good at what you do, I think there will always be a place. The challenge for us is to do better. Always do better. Never be satisfied with where you're at. Always try to achieve a little bit more. It's a neat thought, and it's, uh, it's also a good feeling to know that you uh, are actually you know, supplying the world with food. I'm doing something viable. It's not just for myself because we can never drink all the milk that goes in our bulk tank. So I'm hoping that someone down the road will enjoy the ice cream and the cheese and the butter that I help to uh, produce. Farmers are a valuable asset to America, to the world. When Holstein America returns, we travel to Minnesota to learn how a family overcame a serious farming accident to continue in the dairy business. Merck Animal Health is proud to share stories from America's dairy farmers by sponsoring Holstein America. When every decision counts, trust Vista to help protect your herd against respiratory and reproductive diseases. See how Vista offers the industry's most complete protection at thebestdefense.com. Welcome back. Though the dairy industry and much of agriculture has experienced tough times in recent years, we're often reminded of the opportunities that rural America still offers. One example is Rody Dairy of Minnesota. Back in 2015, Jeff Rody lost half his leg in a farming accident. But through the support of his family, friends, and neighbors, he continues to work every day on the dairy, 
building a brighter future with registered Holsteins. August 3rd, 2015, um, doing normal straw, putting it up in the, in the, in the one barn. I rode an elevator up and it took my leg off. I rushed home, I got home and there were 30 cars in the yard and two sheriff's deputies and the rescue squad. I mean, it was shocking and overwhelming and you know, it was a lot to take in all at once, but I knew we were gonna be okay. It was just gonna be different. I bounced right back after that. I got my leg in October and people really stepped up and come in and help and didn't need to be paid. And they, they're coming in with their own equipment and helping you out. And it's been a, you know, a godsend that, you know, that, but that's what these small towns do. The neighbors help each other out. I've always had a pretty good attitude about life in general, and, and so you just, you know, keep going. There's not much else you can do. You can either sit back and cry about it or get on your horse and go at it, and, that, and that's what we do. You know, he had days where it was, obviously it was tough, but didn't want to end up in a, you know, a deep depression. He was back in the skid loader a month after the accident. Luckily, we had a skid loader with hand controls, so he was able to get back in the skid loader. And, you know, he wanted to know what was going on. He wanted to be involved, you know, always being someone who's working hard and involved in what's going on. You know, you, you got to look at things a whole lot different because I can't run and I can't jump and I, I can't lift a lot, but it's just, uh, it's just a different normal is what it is. We'll take it day by day. There's nothing better than sitting on the deck here and looking at the crops that we've raised and, and what we've done for the year, what you worked all summer for, coming ready to put in, in uh, to harvest. It's, it's a good feeling. We bought our first registered cows in 1994 from the very folks whose kids I grew up with. They started sharing their wisdom with us and we bought a couple cows from them and then they had a dispersal. We bought six cows on their sale. You know, once we got a few registered cows, my goal was to have everything registered, which we do. And, you know, we just kept growing with what we're doing with the registration and classifying. And I just really think there's a added value to having a registered animal with a pedigree behind it that people who are really interested in buying a quality animal want to know where it comes from and what the pedigree is. And we've been able to do some merchandising and marketing, sell daughters, you know, sell some bulls, sell embryos, and we wouldn't be able to do that with a grade herd. There's just, you know, it, it wouldn't happen. We're always just trying to breed cows that are functional, focused on type, production. You know, there's been great tools that have come along with the Holstein industry that just really, you know, help us be able to find bulls that we'd like to use. I look a lot at TPI, which is kind of covering everything as far as all the factors that we'd be looking at. But we're generally trying to breed a cow that's gonna be easy to work with, not gonna have any health issues, good feet and legs. I don't know, don't you just love black and white? The challenges are the market, the economy, but there's been ebbs and tides in the last 30 years. It's not like this is the first time we've had to deal with low milk prices and high input costs and you know low commodity prices. It's just, it comes and goes. You just have to try and weather the storm. My wife's just so dedicated to it with the reproduction and the cattle that we have, and, and uh, that helps us survive, and good genetics. And uh, we've done the, the embryo work and stuff, and we do a good job of raising crops. And you gotta love what you're doing. Carver's with us now. He's been with us since he's been nine. He's 17 now. Um, I've got a lot of nephews that have been here with us through the summers. When we talk now to the kids who used to come when they were, you know, young adults or teenagers, and they're working in completely different fields and they're living in the city, but, you know, they still remember coming to the farm and learning how to do things. Just the pride they felt in, in driving a tractor, in moving hay bales. You know, it's rewarding to talk to people that we personally know that we've made a difference with and also just our industry. You know, there's a lot of good people that we have come to know over the years. And a lot of it has been because we have registered cattle. You know, we know people that we've met at sales. We talk to them every week. So it's, it's been great to make those friendships. 
nothing satisfies like a cold glass of milk, the most nutritious natural protein drink on earth. And a wonderful treat like this wouldn't be possible without the registered Holstein cow. If you'd like to learn more about registered Holsteins, visit HolsteinUSA.com. On behalf of America's registered Holstein breeders, thanks for watching Holstein America. I'm Michelle Davidson.